everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Reliability Boombox, proudly brought to you by Reliability Extranet group of companies, which includes the Logic and Reliability Analytics. Now, um, welcome back, Seven. Nice to have you here again, my lovely Thank co-host. You. Thank you and very much, sir. Today, we've got a very special guest, um, a very special guest from our Logic brand. So, the Logic's um, headquarters are in the US and we've got one of the founding members here, founding members, founding owners, of where he sits. Um, he can explain that, but Mr. Brian Hughes. Welcome, Brian. Hey, thanks, guys. It's great to be here and I appreciate uh, having me on. It's going to be fun. Great. Is well, it? Uh, it, yeah, <laughs> it is going to be fun. Um, as usual, Brian, just for your sake, we like to just have a little bit of a fireside chat, talk all things sort of um, problem solving, machine learning, anything that can help industry maintenance, uh, even other industries, just to, to do better in their business. Um, and where we see that the Sologic so Social fits. Now, um, just for the rest of the listeners out there, uh, can you just give us a brief rundown on where you sit? in Sologic, yeah, your role, um, hey, you came to be there. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, well, we started Sologic in 2011, having come out of a similar company uh, after um, after 10 years in that previous company. And we decided that we wanted to do, you know, our own thing and, and take things in our own direction. And, uh, um, you know, we made the decision early on that we wanted a tactical sort of centered root cause analysis process and by that we you know there's a lot of philosophy and a lot of uh, i guess logic and a lot of sort of um you know high-minded thinking that goes on behind the scenes with a mm. root cause analysis process and and it's a lot of fun you know to kind of nerd out on all that stuff but at the same time you need to have a process that's practically useful in the field and so our goal early on was, okay, well, if we're gonna develop this process, what we're gonna do here is, is make sure that we keep it really focused on, on uh, tactical use, something that, that folks can just pick up and use in their everyday lives to help them solve problems. And um, so that, that sort of is the, that, that, that theme runs through the training product. It runs through the way that we teach our classes, the way that we run our investigations. And then as a big part of that, we realized too, that we really needed to develop software that would support that process. So mm -hmm. you don't really need root cause analysis software to do root cause analysis. Obviously I have got sticky notes on my desk here that, uh, that we use, you know, kind of old school analog methods, um, you know, dry erase boards, flip charts, sticky notes, whatever. But at the same time, the software that we had in mind, it was going to be something that would sort of be seamless as part of, as part of the uh, uh, investigation process. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's a pretty tall order to develop something from the ground up like that. But, you know, we've been doing it ever since the beginning. And at this point, I think that uh, we've, we've got a product that we're really proud of and, and something that's really useful. So as a guy like me who really likes to uh, learn investigate, figure out how things work, figure out how they break and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this software for us, I find it to be super useful. If you think about, I think the analogy I've been using lately is that, uh, you know, a carpenter can build a house. In fact, the house around me right now, you can't see it, but it was built in, the, it was almost a hundred years old. It was mm. built with hand tools, you know, so yeah. it was built hammer <laughs> nails you know or saw these guys are out here working hard putting this thing together but they don't do that anymore any carpenter can build a, a house with the hand tools just the same as any analyst can build root cause analyses with the uh, hand tools of that craft um these days though you know they're using air nailers and power saws and anything that they can get an edge to make things uh, uh higher quality more consistent and build it faster and that's the way that I think about uh, root cause analysis software. So, you, of course, you got to know what you're doing, but at the same time, it just it, it makes the whole process a lot more efficient and a lot easier. So, um, and so Fantastic. yeah, that's kind of the, the background of Sologic and what our goal was. And here we are, you know, ten years later, and I think that we're doing a pretty good job that way. Um, 
And then, you know, my, my role personally inside the company is uh, I focus on uh, um, developing content, developing, helping to develop courses, writing what we hope to be interesting uh, example problems, articles, doing presentations, and working with instructors to make sure that we are, um, to make sure that that we are, uh, you know, kind of staying on the current edge of, uh, of of the RCA field, and and really listening and building relationships, even with other RCA providers, even with you know people that would be considered our competitors. But I feel like we've got a a respectful and friend, friendly relationship with a lot of those folks. And quite frankly, you know, we're open to learning from anybody at any point. If uh, if there's value there, then we want to learn about that, you know. And if we're doing something that that maybe could be done a little bit better, or something that um, that that uh, may not provide as much value as we originally thought, then we're not precious about it. We just get rid of it and and um, and kind of move on. And in that way, you know, it's this kind of rolling process of continuous improvement. So, yeah. Yeah, awesome, and and I love the the focus of the continuous improvement. That's one of the things I've certainly appreciated about the logic in in my short term time with the organisation working with Seven on it. Is every time that we get a question or a query, and we just talked about one before we started the show. Um, for you guys, it's like, yeah, no problem. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll put it in the pipeline, or not yet, but certainly it's in the in the pipeline to do down the track. Um, and that's one thing that I, I really valued. I think from my experience, maybe this is something that happened to you, hence you you guys ended up uh, starting Sologic was in your past experience that some of the old tools, people were stuck in their old ways and not wanting to redesign, review, or, or take the customer's feedback and change to make the improvements. And um, it's one thing I really do like about about Sologic and the the software in itself, and even the training processes and methods. I've seen the training programs improve, and um, yeah, I think that's that's fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, well, you know, um, so we've been broadening out a little bit too. Our initial focus was root cause analysis, and mm -hmm. our founder, uh, our co-founder Chris Ecker. So Chris and I started the, the company. Um, and one of the things that was important to Chris, we, uh, he wanted to be the best. He wanted to do something that we could be the best at. And so we focused really narrowly in on that root cause analysis topic because or that root cause analysis part of, I guess, the realm of structured problem solving. And uh, because we knew that that was, that was really what we were good at. And, um, and so, but now when you think about it, it's all part of a broader sort of, uh, I guess, offering of, of looking at, at how did things come to be, you know, how did things come to pass? And then how can we learn from those things so that we make better decisions right now to hopefully see a mm -hmm. future that we like better or the future that we desire to sort of unfold. And so, you know, like, cause well, the only place that we can really do anything is right now in the present. So how do I make the best decision? And how do our clients, how do we, how does our process help them make the best decisions in the present, whether they're learning from the past or whether they're imagining the future and, uh, and what could potentially happen. So we've been branching out into other areas too. So failure modes, effects analysis, we've been doing a bunch of that work. Uh, yep. where, and then also human and organizational performance. We've been branching into those areas too, because these are all adjacent sort of topics to root cause analysis. And yep. our clients, you know, they are they benefit from from that sort of broader vision. And so, really, we've been um, over the last, I'd say, you know, 12, 18 months, really sort of broadening out away from that root cause analysis specific focus. Because you know, there's other things that we can do that uh, that that makes sense in that whole realm, as well. So it's kind of fun, you know. And 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 I'll tell you this: I'm in it. I love the FMEA process. To tell you the truth, I you know, so I'm I'm, I'm not. I would not consider myself a, a complete expert in that process, but I've done a bunch of them now, and um, you know, so I'm feeling I'm feeling more comfortable and more confident in the, the role of, of leading those things. And one of the things that kind of came to mind uh, as we were leading one of these FMEA sessions 
um, is just how much people learn. I, me, personally, I love to learn about how things work and how they could potentially break down mm. and all that stuff. But then I realized that probably the most important thing that a facilitator, whether you're uh, leading a, a root cause analysis or whether you're leading an FMEA or any other type of structured sort of problem solving session, the, the best thing that a facilitator can do is to create an environment where it's very conducive to learning so that because everybody learns from each other and um and together we all uh learn a lot about the process even if we thought we knew it um uh, we always find holes you know and gaps in what we thought we knew and whether it's an rca or an fmea uh, i feel like um the best thing that comes out of it some of the coolest comments that you hear and and the sort of affirmation that you know that you were at least um reasonably successful is they people learn a lot and they say it that you know they talk about geez you know i i didn't realize what i didn't know and i just feel like i ha am in so much better shape having gone through that process i think it's really fun yeah i i certainly agree brian and um i, I love that you highlighted the, the areas that you guys are branching out to and seven and i on, on previous podcasts have talked we kind of started talking about it being rcas but we more so see the software as problem solving in a in a sense and whether it's a human resource problem whether it's through fmeas or other aspects of the business there's a lot of ways that you can use sologix as the as a tool to do so um and one of the things that seven and i talked about just the other week was how great the Sologic is at allowing people to see and to learn. You know, Seven had an experience recently where, and maybe Seven would elaborate a bit more, but there was an RCA that he facilitated where there was a whole people in the room, it was quite an in, um, important RCA, and there was a whole people in the room that sort of subject matter experts, um, managers, other people that and even technicians that have worked on this piece of machinery and had a sort of preconceived idea or concept of what the problem should be. And then they go, and Seven's writing, aha. And everyone comes around and everyone sort of learns. So that's one thing I really like about the, the framework of Sologic and how it can bring everyone around to that, to that sort of thing. Yeah. So, and it's a... And it, and it was coming back to the structured problem solving and it was just that one question at the at the time where the right information was in the right visual form it created that aha moment and i said what caused this and they could see what else was at play at the same time and then they went aha <laughs> we can see what's going on here that's what's happened that is what's happened we've got it you know um yeah, and, it, and, and that particular example that Dane was talking about was, you know, one of those, uh, I, I'd say, amazing moments in my career that I'll probably never forget. That, you know, you've had all these all these uh, technical managers, everyone in the room, all of a sudden, with this one question, with the information in front of them in a visual format, went, aha, we've got this, <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I think I'll remember that one for the rest of my life. Yeah, I had one of those in a class that was, I don't know if it was the first one uh, or what is the one that stands out? And, you know, they use different words than aha. So I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on the podcast. Yeah, you can. You can say what you want. Yeah, 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 there's no problem. <laughs> We're Australian, right? We're Australian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys don't care. Bullshit sort of class. <laughs> I, I, was, um, I was at this pulp and paper plant. And we were going through this issue with, uh, oh, geez, you know, um, uh, it was uh, a piece of equipment called a former. And um, there's a, 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 it was a shower or something like that. I can't remember the specifics, but, you know, they're having an issue with water flow and plugging filters and screens and things like that. And these guys were so confident that they were going to stump me. And, you know, and that's great. I love that. You know, fine. If, if I don't know, I'm the first one that's, gonna, that's going to admit it. Um, but, you know, I just kept asking the question and I followed the process, you know, so I one cause leads to the next and leads to the next and all of that. And a lot of times the best thing that a facilitator can do is really just sort of um, slow the process down just a little bit because you 
get all these contributors and they all want to talk about what they want to talk about. And the subject often is very complex. Even when you think it's simple, there's a lot of inputs and you know, you get everybody throwing stuff at you all at once and it can just sort of be like drinking from a fire hose. So I feel like um, when a when a facilitator, when they get to that point where they realize that, you know, the, the first thing that I need to do is sort of be the bottleneck for information. Don't don't like forget about somebody's contributions or don't sort of discount somebody's contributions, but at least allow the team to focus on one contribution at a time so that you can possibly process that information as it's coming. All right. So I'm doing this in class with this with um with, with this this tough problem and um so it gets to the point where they, these guys they're super good natured about it too but they were sure that they that they're going to stump me with this one but it just kept following the process and i hear from the back of the room oh shit oh <laughs> so it's kind of like an aha process you know aha moment yeah. but this was more of an oh shit moment and you know same kind of a thing <laughs> and then you realize as soon as you hear oh shit and i've heard it a bunch you know in these um in, in, in these different rcas and, and then you know you know you're like yeah yeah oh, it's, it's like breaking through the sound barrier sort of yeah. you know like you you push them farther than than where they knew and then it, it allowed them to you know, because they're subject matter experts, they know this stuff and they're they're super smart folks. And and oftentimes they get a lot of experience and all of that. But it's, you know, it's just about organizing the information in a way that allows them to see it a little differently or see it a little mm -hmm. more clearly. And and then they have that moment. And then, you know, for a, a facilitator, uh, I've, you know, it's kind of a high wire act as a, an investigator. I mean, it's sort of presumptuous to say that you're going to go in to to any place, whether it's a place like this um, pulp and paper mill or Amazon or, well, I don't know, Boeing or, um, you know, uh, the U.S. Navy, all these different clients you go into and they, um, and, and it's sort of presumptuous to say that I'm going to help you solve your problems. You know, these are folks that, that, that are so intimately familiar with this gear, with the equipment and their process. Mm -hmm. Kind of stuff but you know um it takes an outsider's perspective and it takes an outsider i think often to make it safe to not know the answers you know yeah. because you know what i'm saying like like and so and i'm truly i truly want to learn from these folks and so i put myself in the position of a, a one student with you know 10 different instructors all of whom know something different about this overall process and and i think that when when i show that it's okay not to know and i show kind of a vulnerability around mm -hmm. not knowing and um and and a willingness to learn then that hopefully is that 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 sort of spreads to the rest of the group and then they drop their defenses and they're willing to also be vulnerable in an area where you know they they already have a terrific amount of subject matter expertise but it's just the complexity and um it allows you to sort of uh it allows you to sort of untie the knot and then and then it's a really nice sort of shared success when you get to that point yeah i like that i like that analogy untie the knot yeah yes yeah, yeah. Yeah, we love we love analogies here. <laughs> yeah, we love it. Um, that, that, that's awesome. I I totally agree. I think they're some of the fantastic things when you get to and, and like you talked about being the outsider, being the one able to untie the knot. We um, often end up talking about the washing machine analogy, where if you're washing clothes, if you're a piece of clothing thrown in the wash getting thrown around, 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 around the washing machine, you don't realize that you're getting clean, but it takes someone to open the lid and stand outside and go, oh, that's something in there is working and this is what it's doing. Um, and so that sort of objective view is always good. And I think a good facilitator can be that, can be that objective view and sort of point out what's in the washing machine, um, point out what else is going in to fix that or to, to clean it and, and so forth. So. Well, you know, and there's also um, the what 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 is it? Let me say, I, how do we explain this? So there's always a lot going on in the mind of a facilitator because there's a lot more happening sort of between their ears than they're really going to be letting on to the team. So what what you show to the team is that um, 
that, that person that is open to learning, open to admitting that they don't know, open to uh, input from uh, multiple different sources and multiple different people. But, but that's only one part of it, because if you get all of that stuff, what are you going to do with it? How do you organize it in a way that's cohesive and coherent? And that's where the process comes into play. And it's pretty subtle. Um, you know, when, when you are, when you've achieved that sort of level of comfort with the process and with sort of being in that role of facilitating, um, what I, what I find is that the process itself, actually, um, it's providing a, a lot of support. And by the, like, like, in other words, say that you're getting, um, you're getting input from a variety of different, uh, uh, sources in, in like a root cause analysis team or an FMEA team or whatever. And, um, but, but it's when you're able to make those connections and when you're able to sort of help them build that model and see where everything comes together. And, you know, we use a conditional logic diagram to help sort of model out what, what the problem is. And it's an approximation, you know, like when you look at a cause and effect chart and which is this logic model or logic diagram, it's never going to be perfect. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the things that, that, um, that students think at first that they, I think that they go a little too far to the mathematical part of a cause and effect chart. And they think that there is a right answer or a single right cause and effect diagram for any given problem. A, you know, a root it, cause, a single root that, cause. Mm. Yeah, single root, root cause. Single root causes, but even when you can, you can get them past that hurdle, you know, cause that's, it's not really, there are no single root causes for any given problem. Maybe that's a different discussion. Um, but, <laughs> well, you know, they're thinking like it's like a geometric proof or something like that, that there are, if you follow the exact series of steps that you always come up with the single right answer. And the truth is, is that a cause and effect diagram is really kind of a means to an end. And it's it, in the, the, the respect that it's a means, what it is, is a way of organizing all of that information that's sort of flying at you in the middle of the RCA, it gives you a common place to sort of put that stuff. But but not only like a, it's not like you're just throwing it into a big storage bin, it actually has a position, a logical position over the, you know, kind of the, the arc of the story of the problem. And, and it's like an outline. If you were writing a story, for instance, and you wanted to um, start out with an outline, well, that's what the <laughs> that chart is it's like an outline for the story and once you have all of that stuff there and you're able to sort of create a mental image of it and then express that mental image back to the group well um that's every what ends up happening is, is that everybody on the team they end up having a common picture a common understanding versus when you started out a lot of times you know you'll have maybe eight or ten different partially correct or whatever, but different views of exactly what's going on. And at the end of it, everybody has a common reconciled view of what's happening. And the chart is a means to that end. And ultimately the chart though, it's just like, it doesn't, I don't care. I, I really relaxed on the idea that, you know, a student needs to come up with the exact same cause and effect chart that I would come up with. And I, mm. and, and I think that it's a real cool, um, it's a fun, sort of a puzzle, you know, the logical puzzle. One of our instructors this morning called me up and he said, hey, uh, this class that I'm, I'm going into here in 20 minutes, they want to work this problem. And, and it was kind of tricky, you know, because it, 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 what was tricky about it is it was the um, it was the result of two failures that happened sort of subsequently. And um, mm. and, and, and like that the setup of the pro of the problem from a logical standpoint, well, it was, you know, it, it, it's a little challenging to get, to get a problem set up properly. Um, and by set up, I mean, you know, it's kind of the beginning points of the cause and effect chart. Um, but then once you get that, then a lot of the rest of it sort of falls into place. And so I actually really enjoy that part of the process, but that said, there are many roads to Rome and, um, <laughs> You know, I'm not gonna, I don't come down hard on students because they don't come up with the same sort of logical construct that makes sense for me. Um, if they come up, if they're, the measure of a good RCA for me is that, uh, can they explain what happened clearly? 
and and um, to the level of detail that their audience requires. And obviously that can be greater or lesser. You know, you got to know what your audience expects so that you can mm -hmm. um, you can achieve that that. And then also does the set of solutions that you came up with in taking together um, that solution set, does that reduce the risk of recurrence? Or does that control potential future outcomes of similar events to the degree that you are that, that you require? You know, and so and of course that's going to be different from time to time as well. You know, you might just you might a, a simple solution might be fine if the risk of the problem, the probability or consequence is relatively low. Um, but if it's significant or severe, well, then obviously that's going to step up the bar on um, on what you're going to accept as a as your basket of acceptable solutions, right? So, anyway, yeah, yeah. I, I I think that's great, and I totally agree. And um, some of the the trainings that Seven and I have ran, we've actually witnessed just that that these people putting together these RCAs in their groups and their charts look completely different. You know, that it's like, are you guys even talking about the same problem? Like, if you're looking at it from a broad perspective, but as you look closely in, they've all got the same sort of answers in there, or the same um, possible causes and, and questions. And the end result is generally the same. And that's the key point. And I think the flexibility of the tool in that sense, as a tool, you know, um, is is fantastic so i think it's great i, I really like that feature of it and i like that you brought up the the vulnerability and the importance of being vulnerable and willing to actually admit that you don't know everything i think in society today um we're also very afraid of being wrong or if we decide on something being so clear like nope this is the decision i've made and i'm sticking to it no matter what and people will fight, and, you know, tooth and nail to to keep to it. But as a facilitator, if you can be willingness to not know to get something wrong to correct yourself in the process, then you enable and encourage others to do the same. Oh, I mean, I I I I, I got to tell you, like in my personal life, here here, check this out. Hold on, I, I'm off camera. <laughs> but I'm going to listen back to it. But I <laughs> I told you I'm down in my basement, right? Well, one of the things I'm doing, I'm building up a new set of bicycle wheels here. And that's a story for a different day. But this wheel that you see, that looks like a nice wheel. I have screwed this up to the point that I need to take it all apart again. You know what I mean? And I have to, have to gear myself up, not, you know, no pun intended. I have to gear myself up to actually do this because I'm so disappointed that I didn't do it right the first time, you know? And, 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 you know, I was so certain as I put all these spokes together, you know, when I say I'm building it up, I'm starting with the hub here. Where's the front? This is the rear hub, right? But so here's the front hub and it starts out like this. And there's the, you know, just the rim, the hub and the spokes. But I'll tell you what, it's just, a, it's, if you don't do this every day, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a mind twister. And, um, and the thing is, is that being able to, um, you know, admit that, because I was so certain that I was right. And what I love mm -hmm. about kind of projects, you know, like working on bicycles or working on the house or something like that is, you know, because I'm often in a professional role. I'm the guy standing here instructing people how to, uh, how to untangle problems. But that does not mean by any means that I live a problem-free life. And... <laughs> Seriously, man, uh, if I can screw it up, I will screw it up. Things that, yeah. um, projects that, that, you know, like should take one trip to the hardware store, they're going to take me <laughs> to the hardware store. <laughs> like, uh, the thing fun about it is, you know, it's just like I lead these dual lives of sort of uh, being an instructor of how to solve complex problems and then being a, just a Joe Schmo out there screwing everything up. <laughs> in my personal life and so you know like you have to be you, you have to have a lot of humility you know to kind of get through all this stuff but at yeah. the end of the day you know um it, w w the point is, is like a bicycle wheel is not that consequential of a of a problem in in, in you know the grand scheme of, of it all but it really illustrates you know that um that that you always have to accept your humanity <laughs> and that you're dealing with humans and mm -hmm. um 
right? And and that yes, you're learning a very logical sort of mathematical process of how to systematically tear a problem apart and understand how all of its inputs work together. But you're doing that in the context of a group of human beings. And mm. and that a lot of times, you know, you this sort of feel brings together the highly analytical people. Um, maybe not yeah. the people that are so um, would consider themselves uh, sort of more, uh, I guess, adept in the soft skills of people management. But to be a really good, I be a good facilitator. I think you have to both be uh, have that logical mind and that ability to sort of um, stay on track and to. Uh, and to to you know develop a nice mental model of um, of how things combine to you know turn out the way that they did. But at this, you can never forget that you're working with a group of human beings, and and the more that you can bring humanity into that logical process, and it's weird. It's kind of like mixing oil and water, but when you get it right, it really is a neat combination. And and you know for a fact that you're bringing good value to the team. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-oh. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> um, that kind of leads me into a, a bit of a question that, as I said before, I don't plan out these things, but I think questions just come to my mind and, <laughs> and we like to ask them as seven likes to, to get stumped by occasionally, but I don't think this one will stump you. Um, so, so logics as, as an organization has been around for 10 years. It's been the development and improvements of your past experience and, and other software programs. In the 10 years that you've been fully entrenched in this in this process, in this business, and you highlight a couple of the great things that you have done and you, the fact that you're moving into other spaces, not just being the best at root cause analysis. Um, but what would you say the biggest changing change in the last 10 years uh, you've experienced at Sologic um, for the sake of root cause analysis or anything else that you found there. So what's what's the biggest change that you've seen and biggest improvement? Yeah, um, it it has to be on the software side um, mm-hmm. because that's the area of, like it's kind of the wild west still with respect to uh, root cause analysis specific software. So methodology wise, so from a method that you'll find that like the method that we use this conditional logic based method it's pretty stable. Um, We have made some improvements to it, to the method itself, but really there's, and we're always open to making improvements, like you say, you know, and there's certainly, I would, I would say that it's always on a pathway, but the, but I think the slope of the improvement in the method is relatively gradual at this point, that a lot of the, um, the sort of big, big improvements in RCA method uh, the, a lot of those have been made, you know, and so we're not really looking for major breakthroughs in the, uh, the, the sort of logical construct. Um, that said, though, the software that has just been really like there is so much to do in the world of building out software that not only, you know, because at first what we wanted to do was eliminate the sticky note and the dry erase board. And like the, you know, like the innovative use of sticky notes, the 80s technology, you know, that whole uh, isn't 3M, they really made a, you know, a purse out of a sow's ear with this (laughs) kind of thing. And now look at all the innovative things that people are doing with sticky notes. It's like, yeah, well, you know, we're kind of 40 years beyond that now. And um, and so now that we have um, the, the, the computational horsepower, you know, you're able to, um, but, well, I mean, there's just, even just in the iPhone, for instance, you know, there's just so much, there's so much just in the palm of your hand. And, you know, a lot of these things like the artificial intelligence theories that have been around for a really long time, artificial intelligence and the, and, and like the roadmap to building it, this is not any kind of a new concept, you know? So the way that Google maps works, for instance, if you, um, I mean, if I type in Seven's home address and ask for <laughs> directions for how to get there, I mean, it can handle that, mm-hmm. you know, it, it can do that sort of thing. And um, and Amazon, you know, for instance, with what they're doing, with trying to predict, what these guys are doing is really amazing in the United States. And I don't know how it is in, um, in Australia, but like, you know, they're trying to predict what 
what I and everybody around me, right, and, and I didn't mention where I am, but I'm in the city of Seattle and uh, on the, the Pacific Coast. And um, so they, they're trying to make sure that anything that I or any of my neighbors might want is within 24 hours uh, delivery of, of where I am. So that wow. when I ordered it up, order that thing up, that it lands on my doorstep within 24 hours. Well, that's a call ask. And they need things like artificial intelligence in order to predict what um you know what it is that we might order versus someone in a different population center okay well so my point for bringing all of this stuff up is that you know all of, uh, all of these different algorithms and all the the introduction of artificial intelligence and really leveraging the power of computers to process massive amounts of data and then to identify patterns in that data that are useful to us mm. The theories behind this have been around for a very long time, but they just didn't have the horsepower to get the job done. And, um, you know, so, but now we do. All right, well, so then you come to our little niche, our little well, part of the, of the of the software world uh, in root cause analysis, or even, you know, kind of broadening it out a little bit, you know, into more like what we would call structured problem solving. Um, the, 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 the really cool, area for us to build out is well i mean you think about a client that comes to us and says i want you to predict what's going to happen next with some degree of certainty okay well that's mm -hmm. a pretty tall ask right that's what we were talking about this earlier that's where the only thing i can do right now is i got my crystal ball that i keep handy <laughs> so i can dig deep into the mystics and like you know uh, tell me what you see and uh what is my future and all that sort of thing well yeah, you know, the, the, the truth is, is by looking backwards into the things that have already happened in the past and by applying some, you know, pretty, uh, pretty basic sort of strategies around risk and, um, you know, kind of like a little more, uh, I guess, nerdy topics like causal constants or causal variables, these kinds of things. These are not things that we came up with, but things that we're learning to apply to, to cause and effect analysis. Well, you know, we can only really effectively look backwards to see what has happened and look at how it occurred, you know, with some degree of confidence. But mm -hmm. the question really is, is how do I look forward into the future? And um, because the future is uncertain. OK, well, and it's more uncertain the farther out we go, you know, so in, in, in an hour or so, I'm going to be having a brew with a couple of the guys that do programming for us on our programming team. That's what my my plan is now i'm not there yet but you know there's a pretty high degree of certainty that that's what's going to happen because you know you guys have pushed me past it's almost 6 p.m my time here right <laughs> <laughs> right so um but but so um the way that you do that the only way that we can credibly do that at scale is by including uh including artificial intelligence in the world of root cause analysis and so what i find most exciting about the work that we're currently doing and we will release a, an artificial intelligence um uh i guess version of coslink later this year that does a very credible job now not saying there isn't room for improvement because certainly you know we're just sort of scratching the surface of this but using natural language um, it will uh, using natural language and then also the um, the sort of I guess the consistent causal patterns that we have observed in the past around similar type events well we can actually do a very good and useful and practical job at helping somebody predict what um well both what the causes of a past event were so that they can do a better job of doing cause and effect analysis more thorough job um and uh, uh more i guess a thorough job and a faster job uh at at understanding what happened in the past but also by by leveraging the power of what we would call a causal constant which is something that is relatively um i guess uh, I guess less variation associated with it, and therefore it's greater predictable. Um, it's more easily predictable in the future to identify what your likely future would look like. You know, and so guess and Seb, you uh, you you drew a cone. I love your your drawing here. I'm kind of watching on my monitor over here. You know, <laughs> right? So that um that cone over there on the right hand side of when you're looking forward. Yeah. Nice well, one, well, yeah. If you can narrow that cone down. Well, then you're yeah. narrowing 
variation uh, in the potential future outcomes that, that could occur. And therefore, you're lowering the risk mm. associated. You're lowering the uncertainty with what you know now versus what you're predicting is going to happen later. And um, and it's really, I, so, so, you know, to kind of, I know it's a long-winded answer to the question, but w now that we have the computational horsepower and we also have a method that we can employ, basically, you know, you, the computer can do it and we know what to tell the computer to do. That's the most exciting part of root cause analysis right now is in how can we, how can we leverage that com computational power and take advantage of artificial intelligence in a lot of the same ways that these much larger companies are doing, but how can we bring that to bear on problem solving? So, and I just think that that, you know, I feel like like that'll take me to the rest of my professional life. You know what I mean? It's just nothing but blue sky and capability to building that stuff out. And I find it just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And I, um, I, I think that's great, Ed. and I think certainly the software, and as you said, moving from the, the sticky notes into um, computability and, and processing, and I think one thing that you mentioned, and this is probably where the AI is really going to plug in, and one thing I like about the software and like when we get to share it with you know, clients, potential clients and other people, is the um, tracking of the results. You know, you look at an organization and just your straight up original dashboard that you see and you're able to see the most common causes, you know, most common results um, and really sort of dial in on that. I think it, it makes it a great way to prevent the ongoing, you know, like to, you know, you use your crystal ball and look into the future and go, well, we don't want that failure to happen again. So we're going to sort of make those steps and make it happen. So. Well, you know, part of it, part of it is just um, having the organizational discipline to do what you said you were going to do. And mm. this is, I mean, software definitely helps with that. And I would say, you know, in Coslink, um, we recognize that, that, that a lot of the larger, I guess, software offerings that were out there when, um, you know, and, and like I would consider them uh, asset management applications uh, or, um, you know, some of these safety applications and things like that. These are, uh, well, you know, they're made to, to basically capture and organize uh, a lot of incident data um, and, you know, condition monitoring and things like that. So there's a lot of different, like, like crossover in terms of, of some of the larger firms that are out there that are um, these larger products that are out there. Uh, but, but a lot of them pull up short and they do this on purpose. It wasn't like they couldn't, but they just didn't. But, um, you know, really digging into formal root cause analysis and probably because there are different types that are out there. So, you know, so logic and some of the others are based in this sort of conditional logic, this if this and that, then the result kind of logic, you know, um, so like, I guess I would say, you know, well, someone's gonna someone's gonna cheat me for this, but like an improved version of five Y's or five Y's plus, you know. So getting mm -hmm. causal branches in there, um, and that's what we do by and large. Um, but you know, Fishbone is uh, Ishikawa Fishbone diagrams. You know, that's a, that leverages a totally different logical construct that logic of sets. You know, or the mm -hmm. logic of categories, and um, yeah. you know. So there are other root cause analysis methodologies that are out there that are quite successful at leveraging that different form of logic. And the, these are different, you know, there is a time when I would have said, oh yeah, fishbone, it's categorical, it's garbage. <laughs> well, it's not, you know, the truth is, is that anything that you utilize in order to help develop your understanding of the problem and help you come up with better solutions, well, that's if you find value in that, and if that's helping you achieve that, well, then I think that that you know that ought to be we ought to be able to use whatever we need in order to get the job done. You know, so just because one method works might work well for me, um, doesn't mean that another method might not work better for them. So I've really I feel like my own personal view is that I'm much more inclusive in terms of you know the RCA methodologies. But at the end of the day. 
Oh, well, I'll, I'll finish my, the, the point for, for bringing that up. Um, you know, so these larger software firms that are sort of at, uh, uh, capturing and um, incident data and managing incident data, they do a fantastic job, frankly, at, at capturing you know, problems, um, problem impacts, where the problems are happening. Uh, and then um, even they do a great job too at action tracking, you know, so let's say that they come up with a solution, you know, making sure, holding people accountable to make sure that those solutions are put in place. They do a nice job at that. Um, but where they kind of break down is in this middle process, you know, so they, they don't do a great job at the analytical part of root cause analysis. They really have made a strategic decision to actually sort of create this placeholder for root cause analysis, thereby allowing different companies to utilize whatever process they want. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if they, they don't they don't want to wade into this, you know, where they have to develop a, a fishbone based process or a, a five wise based process or, a, you know, a this or a that or the other thing. And so they can just sort of they can say, well, you guys use whatever you want. And then when you have the output from that, then you just put it here. But that there is real value and actually doing the hard work of building that root cause analysis loop. And so our goal with this is, you know, with Coslink is to be or to have a root cause analysis platform such that when, um, you know, where these other companies leave off, well, we pick the ball up and then um, we actually build that whole space out for them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, we, we recognize that we would always be, uh, um, that we need to have the capability of, of playing nicely with these other applications, you know. So from the very beginning, we built Coslink with a with an open API, knowing that we would build these tie-ins. And at this point, we've built a lot of tie-ins to some of these big major firms, and with plans to to build even more out, such that at some point down the line, you know, let's say that you are uh, you're using Maximo or you're using SAP. Or you're using Enableon or Intellex or Devon Way or some of these, what we would consider to be, you know, larger, um, I guess, incident management um, applications. Well, you can just, you know, select what uh, what application you're using and Coslink out of the box plugs into that, you know. So it would be one of those options that would allow the, uh, the company to have um, everything basically in one package. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Well, and, you know, just the, the, there's the other side of it too, where, you know, some companies, some of the companies that we work with, well, they don't have these larger applications. And so in those cases, then Coslink can just carry the full load. And so that's why, you know, you mentioned action tracking and, and holding people accountable, and making sure that, um, you know, the, the things that they said they were going to do, they get done. And Coslink will do all that stuff too. So, you know, we knew that we yeah. had to stand on its own. Or it can be part of a of a larger system, a larger suite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I like the the flexibility of it in that sense. And one thing that Seven and I like to discuss and bring up is the the availability of such products to some of the smaller players. Like I've worked a part of a smaller organization that the cost of a um, a CMS or a management system or an RCA program or some of these bigger players, it's just, it's not viable. It's not the viable option to implement some of these other tools like SAP or Maximo or so forth um, to manage our system. Yet something like the basics versions of RC, of Sologic and Causelink and Causelink Individual, you know, can be viable can be valuable asset and, and tool um, for those smaller companies. So I think that's great. I think it's fantastic. Um, that's right. Seven, have you, have you had any questions or comments that have come up for you? Well, the thing for me with, with CauseLink is, um, like, as you mentioned there, Brian, it, it, it's sort of like agnostic with process. So it, it, it's, it doesn't like with with the recent additions and and where you you guys are just talking about like you know we've got the fish bones and all this sort of stuff happening inside um cause link now we've got for me a module we've got five guys all that sort of stuff so i sort of see it as a like a repository of all the causes of your problems 
and it doesn't matter how you get to those causes it just stores them and you know here's all the problem here's all the problems that mm. we can face as an organization and you've got methods to come to a solution for those problems you know so imagine that if you if you guys had and the artificial intelligence thing is now getting exciting because you've now got a collection of all the potential problems using all these different tools and you're pasting on top of it some artificial intelligence and you can say radio um for example this has just happened and then you go artificial intelligence what tell me what's going to happen next and it will tell you because it's learned it out of this this um big conglomerate or this knowledge base of, of potential problems that your people have inputted and we're not talking about one person we're not talking about two persons we're talking about an entire organization so imagine mm. that, an entire organization's memory dump all in one spot and then you chuck some artificial intelligence over the top of it imagine where that could go well yeah. imagine where that could go what would happen in, in years past is you know you'd get a, a person in who maybe runs a reliability program for uh, um, for mm. a big company you know, and and as the years go on you, they see problem after problem after problem after problem and and one of the things that humans are really really good at is abstracting patterns out of individual occurrences so that they so when you see when you see like something happening around you you're able to sort of abstract up to when you saw a similar it's never the same that's the thing is that no incident no two incidents are ever exactly the same. Everything is a unique occurrence, okay? But it doesn't mean that that um, that that uh, the things that are that happen in the future don't rhyme with things that happened in the past. And by mm -hmm. that, I mean not that it's like they share certain abstracted um, inputs and constructs. And it, and a human being really sees that. And you know, you could probably define what is an expert in any given field is a person yep. that has enough exposure to, and enough repetitions to, um, to, to a diverse enough array of experiences such that they, they personally have built those sort of abstraction models in their minds to where they, when they see something, they can accurately and confidently narrow yep. the range of possibilities to the point where they're essentially limiting the uncertainty about um, yep. any that they that they come up with yeah right. so they can so in, in my little picture here we've got all right. this stuff happening here right yeah. and this human based upon their experience is going to say this one's about to happen that's right because i recognize yeah. that pattern right Imagine, well, you, you know when well, you see this in professional sports you know when when yeah. uh you know someone in their rookie season well, oh, right now, for instance, we're watching Wimbledon. So we're tennis fans. I don't know, are you tennis fans down under? Because we really love the Aussie Open too. It's just yeah, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's one, okay. one of our major sports is tennis down here, yes. Right, right. So you got these up and comers. So one of the one of the more exciting up and comer players um, it, for US tennis is Coco Goff. She's just yeah. brilliant at the sport, but she's really young, but she's only like 17. Um, she's got tremendous skills. She's really advanced for her age, um, but she doesn't have the reps. Okay, well now you look on the other end of the spectrum and you see somebody like Serena Williams. Now Serena's out of Wimbledon at this point, but, but because of an injury. Uh, that said, uh, Serena was once, you know, a phenomenon at at, um, at at 17 years old, and then now here she is in her mid 30s, and um, and the, the the difference between somebody like Coco Gauff and Serena Williams is just that Serena has been there so many times. And so while Coco may physically be capable or even more capable than Serena, and she might hit me in the face for saying that, but um, <laughs> you, know, you never, but, but you know, as a person ages, well, you look at Rafael Nadal, for instance, you know, yeah, yeah. He, he was just, what he was just he could just chase anything down when he was in his youth, but now he's a little slower. Or a guy like Roger Federer, you know, when yep. you, you see these guys and, and uh, but but one of the things that they really possess is that domain knowledge. They have been there. They've been on center court. You know, they've been in the big games. They've succeeded and failed. And so um, they are that person in your in your um, in your drawing thing right now to where they're going to recognize patterns in the game that younger pro players just don't have. Okay, so now um, that. Uh, 
that, and that's kind of the same in industry, you know, and, and you get these o o older folks that have been around um, for a long time and they just can, they can smell when a pump's going to go bad, you know, they just feel it in their bones, right? Gray beads. We call them gray beads. Yeah, well, I'm turning into one myself, man. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm, like, I'm, I'm cleanly shaven today, but I'm, I'm sorry. Sort of Yes, I, mean, I'm a, <laughs> I wouldn't say that I'm a gray beard, but it's it appears, like physically it's appearing, but I don't think I'm there. there. <laughs> well, but so, but even with all the reps that an expert can experience, okay, well, what about what, what, what a computer can do is it can, it can take all of the domain knowledge since we're on tennis anyway, we'll just stay on that. But like, so take everybody, everybody in um, who has ever played the game of tennis and then um and then and then basically get that data into a point where the computer can actually abstract out patterns and and learning and then it can learn from it can combine Federer with serena williams with rafael nadal with novak djokovic um and and then be able to provide somebody like coco Gauff with all of that potential but none of that experience or limited experience and, and really give them a jump start on, on their ability to understand the game. Okay, we'll bring that into industry. And that's the kind of that's the kind of world that that we want to help create. Oh. Uh, I think that we have the ability to do is take these younger engineers, like like I mentioned, you know, we're doing all this work with Amazon, the reliability department these days. Um, you know, you get these people in their first, second year engineering technicians and uh, and often working with equipment that is novel, that's new or being used in a novel or new way, because that's what a company like Amazon does is they just push boundaries every which way. Well, um, somebody in that circumstance, they have to learn fast or they're going to fail, you know, yep. and and they don't really have the the um the latitude that we might have had if you'd started your career in say 1970 you know you had a little room to sort of age gracefully and grow into the into the job but things move so quickly these days that um you know so not only is the, the artificial intelligence part of problem solving interesting it's also ripe you know the time is yes it, like it, like i feel like companies need that edge or they're simply going to get rolled. You know, they, they have to learn a lot faster. And the only way really to do that, because the human just even, as brilliant as a human mind is at recognizing patterns and developing domain knowledge and um, and developing that that sort of innate sort of uh, unconscious capability to predict what's going to be able to happen. A human just can't scale, you know, and mm -hmm. that's the, the end of the day. There's only one uh, Serena Williams, right? Well, you're, if you're in the world of Amazon or, or someplace like that, where things are moving so quickly, ah, you just, you, the scale of, of, the, of the need is just so great that, you know, we really need the computers to come online and help us in this area, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, can I, I was gonna say, it's sort of like, if we, if we now take it out of tennis and put it into an industrial sense, yeah, okay, yeah. Or, a, or a business sense, so what, I'm going to draw a picture, <laughs> I love, as you can tell you, I draw pictures. So imagine a thing, whatever that thing is, and I'm just going to draw it as a circle, where all of the knowledge of past events from all these different people that have lived in the company, right, or worked in the company, has resided in this one spot. So all the lessons say since 1970, so let's say we had 50 years worth of learnings from problem solving. So 50 years worth of problems and all of those problems have been solved and all of that learning resided in one spot. Yeah. yeah. And what you're saying is we could put an AI over the top of that, looking in on all of these learnings and our young junior engineer I'm going to draw a different color here. We're going to put it green. I'm going to do it green. Okay, this is our green. Our green I think that's a young junior engineer right there on Dane's lap. I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> a little, a little junior little ocean is working yeah. up. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is this is we're a family orientated company here. <laughs> so, <laughs> example of it. Um, so our junior engineer could say, "Hey, I've just had this happen." So part. A 
has just broken. And the junior engineer will be able to say, what caused part A to be broken? And our AI would be able to answer that. Yeah. Yeah, with a high degree yeah. of confidence. Yeah, with a high degree, at, yeah. Well, at a higher level of abstraction. So with a, a, like a little lower degree of certainty or specificity, but at the same time, then the, the junior engineer can then can then kind of take it the rest of the way, you know? So right. can, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, okay, so let's go back, go into the world of reliability for a minute. You know, so think they, like think about your your PF curves, right? So, yeah. um, where where does that um where does where does that PF curve start? And, and you know, so where what's the earliest phase where you start seeing your capability deteriorate? And um, and so, how early of a of a warning sign could you possibly have, it, which basically gives you more time to respond before you actually mm. you know fall into functional failure and what it does is it is um is is by taking all of that input and now we're going a little bit um what, what we're, we're leveraging what we would learn from past failures and then um leveraging what we would learn from past failures but but recognizing the signs of a failure much earlier you know so let's say that you've got a uh you're you got all this condition monitoring and other sort of data that you're taking in and able to crunch and calculate. Um, well, if you know causally how those inputs have contributed to past problems, so just like your your um, your, your corpus of information that you sort of um, uh, 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 diagrammed out up above, where all the people have yeah. learned from the past, yeah. year, everything in that circle. Well, now um, you don't even have to basically that you don't have to let part A fail. Uh, that what the AI can do is predict with a high oh. degree of certainty the failure before the failure actually occurs so that you can catch it in your window. You know, so yeah. let's say you have a maintenance window or a downtime window. Um, and uh, and so it basically it can prioritize your task list to do the things that you need to maintain. So you're truly in that sort of, uh, um, you're in that predictive maintenance, um, truly predicting yeah. what, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, I've been learning a lot. You know, I, I got pushed here. I got some books back here. Where's my favorite one? I set it aside. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Are you guys fans of John Mowbray? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, this yep. RCM2 book is one of the greatest things I ever read. I And I know that that might make me a little weird, but, you know, I read this thing cover to cover on vacation when we were camping two summers ago. And I just, I just think this guy, I wish he was still around, you know, he died early, he died too young, but before he did, he left this gem. And, you know, I've been just trying to really incorporate all these lessons ever since. And, um, you know, gosh, a guy like that, what, what a guy like that would be able to do with artificial intelligence. I just, you know, I feel like it's kind of everybody's responsibility to pick up where people like, like him left off and many others, by the way, certainly not just him. There's loads of folks out there in that world of reliability that, um, you know, it's kind of our job to pick up where they left off and then carry it forward with the capabilities yeah. that we have today, you know, advance yeah. the ball the field as far as we can. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Well, I love it. And I think um, we all know that we could talk forever and a day about <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. Seven and I often get carried away. And, and, and I think there's one thing we like about you, Brian, too, is we all get carried away and have long extended conversations about different bits and pieces. Um, but look, I think we've covered a lot. I think we've really covered uh, sort of a bit of where Sologic came from, a bit of the background of how it came to be, why you and Chris started the the Sologic brand why you looked at improving the process and and the desire to be the best in rcas but then the willingness and the vulnerability to actually shift and change and go well actually there's more opportunities there's more ways to help businesses and um to branch off into the fmea to branch off into the other problem solving tools and, and options that you've sort of highlighted there throughout the process and then to also talk about some of the experiences that you've had, some of the oh shit moments or the aha moments. Um, and then the, just the benefits of software in itself and actually using such a tool as Causelink. And 
the big improvement in the RCA process and moving from sticky notes to computerized information. And then like we just talked about how it all tied together, just allowing us to do things better, you know, to continue to learn from either past mistakes and past improvements and to pass on that knowledge. As I've mentioned in previous podcasts, I am a tradesman from a background. Now, when I did my craftsman, trade, craftsman, craftsman in American sense. Sorry, yes. craftsman in, in American Ameri- sense. Well, well, we've got to be, we got to be bilingual here. We've got to be Australian. Uh, we, and, okay. we do. Um, <laughs> so, so being a craftsman or a tradesman, if you're Australian listening, we were taught certain ways and certain things, and it was often knowledge just passed on from your tradesman as you're an apprentice, and now being able to capture that from a business's point of view all that information and all that knowledge that 50 years of, of knowledge and utilize it and input it into the tool and that to allow us to continue to improve things um, i think is a fantastic tool and i really like where the logic is going um yeah and this is certainly a session to uh sort of highlight the logic and how it can benefit people and, and others um in, in those spaces, but more so just to hear from yourself, Brian, on, on the as one of the founders as to where you see going, where it's come from, some of the tools and things that you're passionate about and like about it. Uh, so I do thank you very much for your time um, in that and, and sharing. So honestly, we'll probably get you on again to talk about a few different things and uh, maybe give some examples of things that you've experienced. Um, Seven, I don't know. Have you got anything else there you want to add or? or I think I'm done, mate. I'm done. You think you're done? <laughs> you're done? We've we both had a very big day. I've uh, had a big right. day. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm, just, I'm just loving it. I'm just loving it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. And, and Brian's, Brian's ready to go off for a brew with some of these others. I've got my little one here, Ocean, trying to just work it up from a nap to um, come and say, Dad, come and play with me and do some other things. So with that, uh, thank you again, Brian, for your input, for your, your candidness and your, your honesty and humility. Um, it's much appreciated. No problem. Yeah, this has been super fun. I uh, Super fun. I'll do this anytime, you guys. You can. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> okay, awesome. So I, I appreciate it. And, yeah, guys, if you want to, um, anyone out there listening, you can subscribe and like our podcast anywhere you get it from leave us a review that always helps getting the good word being spread comments and feedback um if you'd like to catch up with brian and ask him questions i'm sure i'd be happy to be reached out on linkedin i take you on linkedin there brian yep and um yeah if you have any questions shoot them through and we're happy to answer them as we go but thanks again everyone for checking in and listening And if you've got anything else you'd like to hear about, let us know. We'll see you later.